Let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, our loving and gracious Lord, we are here in your presence and we praise you and worship you through these beautiful hymns. We lift up our hearts to you now in prayer and we are here to listen to your word. And we are not just one to be listeners, Heavenly Father, but we want to be doers of your mighty word. Please help us to understand your word and the interpretation of it, so we may glorify your name by doing what you want, not what we want. And thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus, your Holy Son, set the example for each and every one of us, because Jesus came to glorify your name. He died on the cross, but he rose again on, from the dead on the third day. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you provided and you have given forgiveness of sins and life everlasting for each and every one of us who accept you as, as Savior and Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being with us by the power of the Holy Spirit and he leads us and guides us on this path of life. And thank you, Jesus, that you would never leave us alone as you have promised. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you for being with us now. Thank you for showing us the way and the truth, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus. We want you. Please be with us. Please guide us. Please comfort our hearts. And please help us. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Dear, dearly beloved, the Bible verse that I would like to lay onto your hearts found in our scripture reading, uh, in the, and from the scripture reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 11, I would like to lay onto your hearts. The man who was blind said this. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Please be seated. <coughs> Dearly beloved, we are at the second Sunday of Lent. We are in the Lenten season, and as you know, we are preparing for a wonderful and great event of the Resurrection, and we will commemorate and remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. Of course, as we heard uh, before uh, his resurrection, there was Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. Monday, Thursday, when Jesus gave the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, he explained what that piece of bread and sip of wine means. And on Good Friday, he fulfilled the salvation plan of God by dying for each and every one of us on the cross so we would receive the forgiveness of sins and uh, by his resurrection, the life everlasting. So in this Lenten season, dearly beloved, we would like to examine and, uh, and learn more about how Jesus fulfilled that plan that we call the salvation plan of God the Almighty. And today I brought you a story from the Gospel of John chapter 9, as we heard uh, Louis uh, reading that. And in this story, we heard about a blind man who met Jesus and the Lord healed him. And immediately a question could come into your mind, into my mind. How could we put that, uh, this uh, story and this healing together with the salvation plan of God? And uh, I hope that by the end of this sermon, you will understand that this was part of Jesus' calling and Jesus' calling as fulfilling God's, the Heavenly Father's, salvation plan. So, as we heard, this blind man uh, met Jesus and, uh, and the Lord came to him and healed him. We may say that this was one of the most interesting healings of Jesus. How it happened, let us look at this morning. After the Lord saw this blind man, he made some mud with the saliva and put it onto the man's eyes and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. 
The man did as he was told, and he came back seeing. It was an obvious miracle, since he was blind, and now he was healed. We may also find in this story that not only this man's eyes have seen, uh, have seen the light for the first time, very first time, but he could also see the light of the world, the Savior Jesus Christ. So not only he, his eyes uh, had, had been opened so that he could see colors, people, trees, uh, flowers, and name it, but his spiritual eyes had been opened to see Jesus as his Savior and Lord. None of these are easy. It's not easy to open a physically blind man's eye, eyes. And it's either not easy, neither easy to open someone's eyes, spiritual eyes, to see Jesus as Savior and Lord. If, we, if you look around in this road and we check how many people just Let's, let's not talk about the whole world, but your immediate family members. How many people, how many family members you have who accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and walks with Him in the everyday life? And uh, we would say that many of them, many family members believe in God, but everything that comes with following Jesus Christ and taught in the Bible is not that effective in their lives. So that's why I am saying that in the world and thus in, in our immediate family, we may find those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord yet. So we have much work to do, professing Christians, dearly beloved. So in, a, uh, in this story, we find this blind man who was healed by Jesus Christ. And in contrast with this man who was formerly blind, there are many who live in blindness in this world. And again, I am not talking about physical blindness, but spiritual and ethical and moral blindness in this world. If we look at today's society, we may see that many people nowadays miss the direction of life. Many people don't know what to do in certain situations. They cannot know what path of life to take. They don't know how to make wise decisions in this world. That's why we have many people's lives ruined. And they don't know how to get out of it. Just think about those who struggle with alcohols or drugs or uh, with uh, sexual immorality. So there are many issues, problems in this world. And this is, we may call this, a blindness in this world. Let me share a, sh a short story with you that I found on Facebook regarding what we just heard, the spiritual blindness in this world. A grandmother wrote this story about her grandson in school. My five-year-old grandson, Gabriel, recently started his first year of school and it just tugs my heartstrings to watch my angel growing up so fast. I was so excited to hear about all the wonderful things that he has learned so far. But it broke my heart when I picked him up from school one day and he told me about what happened in class. I got in trouble during our time today, he said. I could tell he was holding back tears. What could my little angels, angel have possibly done to get in trouble? Miss Jones told us to make a drawing of our heroes. So I drew a picture of Jesus. He is my hero. But Miss Jones told me I needed to make a new drawing of someone like a firefighter or a police officer she said that drawing Jesus was not a lot. I was so shocked that I was almost left speechless. Being proud of our faith is against 
school, school rules now. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, unfortunately we may state that there is spiritual blindness in this world. This world is not on the direction where God wants us to be. We are not following that direction. The stunning thing is that we Christians, let's not just talk about the world in general, but let's sweep around our own area, our own territory, as we say in Hungarian, that we Christians and also churches may also live in spiritual blindness. We are not exempt from it, unfortunately. And many churches, many Christians are not, from, not exempt from it. We may also miss the direction. Yes. God shows us the way. The Holy Spirit shows us the way. He whispers it into our ears. He shows uh, in, into our hearts. He speaks in, uh, to our hearts. And then we don't do it. We do not see, actually do not want to see what is obvious in front of our eyes many times. He leads us and guides us. He shows us the way. He gives his word. But many times we miss the point, which, which is obvious, you know, it's there, black and white. And you may see it in the, in the Gospels, in the Scriptures. This is because, dear friends, we have been blinded by our own desires, our own selfishness and laziness. I know what I want, and I know how to accomplish that. This is the, the saying of today's society that has an effect on the Christian Church. We hear what God says to us. That is obvious. For example, when we are at home and we are praying and we are reading the Bible, we hear and we see, we read what God says to us. That is obvious. Or when we listen to the sermons here in church, we are here today. But the thing is that somehow we are blinded by what we want to do, the way we want to spend our time and our money. Basically, our willing, many times, is the obstacles to fulfill the direction of God versus the direction of our own desires. And there is a question there, how could anyone commit himself or herself to God as Jesus taught? And this is a valid question, don't misunderstand it, dearly beloved. This is a valid, valid question, but, but that should not be an excuse that what Jesus said, how we should commit ourselves, then it would say, oh, we cannot do it, I am unable to do it. So that gives us a relief, and we don't have to deal with that. Many years ago on New Special, the founder of the Vineyard Christian Fellowship, the great revivalist, John Wimber, was interviewed. Wimber said that the, that the first time he went to church, he expected dramatic things to happen, but they did not. After attending church for three Sundays, he became so frustrated. After the worship service, he approached a man who looked like someone with authority, one of the leaders in that church. So he asked, he asked this question. When do you do it? He asked. When do we do what? The man replied. You know, the stuff. Wimber answered. And what stuff might that be? The man asked. The stuff in the Bible, Wimber said, becoming more frustrated by the moment. I still don't understand, the man replied. You know, said Wimber, multiplying loaves and fish, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind people, that stuff. Oh, the man said apologetically, we don't do that. We believe in it and we pray about it, but we do not actually do it. Dear friends, in this Lenten season, 
Christ calls you and me for self-examination of hearts and minds. I would like to emphasize it again and again, as I did in the past 20 years in the life of this Church, in the past 20 Lenten seasons that I preached to you and I taught you. This is the time, Lenten season, for spiritual self-examination. Because Jesus wants us to think about how we follow Him, how we see Him, and what He wants. Not what I want, not what you want, but what He wants. And hear it, listen to it, and do something about it. And actually do it. Christ says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Being a follower of Jesus Christ, dear friends, involves and requires change. Many times we don't like changes. Is that correct? We want the good old things, okay, that, that we got used to, so we don't want new things. But it is, is, it is important to have changes in our lives. For example, yesterday, if we are not talking, uh, talking about just the spiritual life changing, we had a totally new event in the Church's life last night, the Family Board Game Night, that we will hear more about it in the, in the announcements. And it was great. Many people came. Many people enjoyed fellowship. Many people love the food that we prepared for them out of the love of our heart to God and to them. And that helps. And this was a change in the life of, the, of our church in a certain way. But talking about spiritual changes, a transformation of our lives and growth, it's, these are very important, dear friends. Following Christ starts with a conscious decision that you want to follow Him every day. And uh, it doesn't mean, dearly beloved, uh, uh, that following Jesus, that you, you follow Him Monday, Thursday, and Friday, and, uh, and you just skip Wednesday, or, uh, or Sunday, or Saturday. That would be foolish. That, that, would, doesn't, that would not make sense. That following Jesus on certain days and certain days you would not. Or maybe you just retire from following Jesus. Okay, you say that, oh, I have followed him uh, for 20 years, 60 years, and uh, I don't want to follow him anymore. That would be silly to say. So, following Jesus is an everyday process. It's like growing, growing a plant in your garden. You cannot say the plan that, hey, stop growing. It will grow because that's so natural. So it should be natural for us Christians that we are growing in the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By this, we will be able to see clearly, dear friends, see clearly Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And this daily decision daily conscious decision that, yes, I want to follow Jesus from your side and my side, will help also others to see who we belong to. And we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us take Him to our family members, friends, co-workers, to our fellow people. Let us take Jesus Christ as followers as daily followers of our Savior to other people so they may see the light of the world and they would not stay in their spiritual blindness. May God help you in that. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved. Heavenly Father, thank you for your teaching. Thank you for being with us now, and you want us to hear your word. And actually, not just hear your word, but act upon your word. Please, Jesus, be with us as we want to follow you. 
as we are also struggling and we are in the trials and difficulties of this life. But we would not want to give up the relationship with you, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you see that there are many things that tempt us, many things that want us to be blind. Maybe our own selfishness, our laziness. Maybe some others have high expectations that we would be never be able to fulfill. But the greatest enemy, Satan, is there to bring spiritual blindness even upon committed Christian people. Oh Lord, please protect us and please help us to walk with you as we are praying and reading your word in a daily basis at home or when we are uh, anywhere else, Lord. Because we are so, uh, it's, a, it's a great blessing that we are, we are free to pray and read the Bible anywhere we go. And we are here in your sanctuary, Heavenly Father, in your house, and we may hear your mighty word. Help us to follow it. Lord Jesus, please continue to be with us, be, be with our church, Lord, and be with uh, our nation as uh, this nation uh, faces major decisions. Lord, I pray and our congregation prays that help the leaders to walk on your way, walk on your path, and there would not be such decisions like we cannot draw Jesus or any students cannot draw Jesus in a school setting. Oh Lord Jesus, please help us to remember how this country was founded by our forefathers. Lord Jesus, it was on biblical basis. The main foundation was your holy scriptures as this country was founded. And we praise your name for that. Please bring revival, renewal into the life of our church and churches throughout the United States of America. And Lord, please bless us so that more and more Christians would be a light, a light of the world by you, Jesus. In your name we pray, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.